I'm going to talk to you about how we could go about creating a wheat disease resistance gene atlas as a public resource for our gene discovery and cloning that could underpin wheat breeding. Worldwide, 772 million tonnes of wheat is grown each year, but a study of responses from breeders by Savory and colleagues last year revealed that a fifth of yield is estimated to be lost to pests and diseases, the most impactful being leaf rust, fusarium head blights, atoria, chitocide blood, and so on. Given the current wheat yields, this can be projected to 209 million tonnes of wheat that we could have in the absence of these diseases. One way to recapture this lost yield would be to have an arsenal of characterised resistance genes to target these. Kratinger and colleagues demonstrated the exponential growth in the number of wheat resistance genes over the last couple of decades. To date, there have been 40 published cloned wheat R genes, so this exponential trend is still ongoing. However, we hope that with an internationally concerted effort, we could buck this trend and go even faster. Of course, there are two sides to a coin, and the cloning of effectors corresponding to R genes has been lagging behind. With cloned effectors for wheat's major pathogens, it would be easier to run accurate molecular diagnostics on pathogen strain, as well as to test the efficacy of individual R genes in different wheat backgrounds or in stacks. There are several methods for cloning these genes. Traditional approaches, such as mutational genomics or biparental mapping, rely on lab-generated population structures and only allow access to the genetic variation present in one or two individuals. These approaches can also be difficult when using wild species due to their often poor agronomy. You can see here this example of Agelox talshai compared to wheat that the glooms look very obstructive. Diploid genomes are also very sensitive to mutagenesis, and there are similar limitations when working with pathogens due to complex life cycles and difficulties with bulky and mutagenizing spores on a large scale. Association genetics, on the other hand, utilizes the historic recombination events that have structured wild populations and allows access to the pangenome variation. In terms of genotyping, enrichment sequencing can be cost effective, but unbiased methods are possible with the continually falling cost of genotyping. Methods like chromosome flow sorting across so many individuals may not be practical, but whole genome shotgun sequencing across a panel is now more and more feasible. All these methods ultimately seek to find a correlation between genotype and a trait of interest. With association genetics, one set of genotypic data can be used to run analyses on multiple traits, allowing many genes to be cloned with one sequence configured panel. So if our aim is to create a large catalogue of R genes for breeding and to do this rapidly, association genetics may be the most efficient approach. Sequencing diversity panels is no small task, so it is important to capture the maximum amount of genetic diversity whilst limiting computation on sequencing costs. To do this, we can categorise assemblies by the quality and information that they provide into platinum, gold, silver and bronze. The first step would be to perform cost-effective genotyping, to remove duplicate accessions and to perform some population analysis to identify major ancestral groups and the phylogenetic distribution of accessions. After this quality checking step, platinum assemblies can be generated, ideally one accession per major ancestral group. In wheat, for example, there are nine. These assemblies would provide chromosome level pseudomolecules, giving the position of all genes in their physical context and allowing the anchoring of fragmented assemblies. Gold level sequencing could be performed for individuals representing the major clades in each ancestral group and allow definition of haplotype blocks in the genome, as well as capturing copy number variation. This is important for the interrogation of all genes in, in the LD block of a region associated with a trait of interest. Depending on the panel, tens of accessions could be sequenced to silver level to obtain gene level resolution, including regulatory elements, important for designing and engineering gene constructs for functional validation of candidate genes. Combined with the platinum and gold assemblies, this would capture the pan gene and pan gene regulatory space. The remaining accessions could then be sequenced to bronze standard with low coverage alumina reads to capture the genome wide SNP variation in the rest of the panel. Additional bells and whistles could be added, such as the epigenetic status of gold level accessions, shown here with methylated site indicated by blue lollipops. And this could be combined with RNA-seq data for all the accessions at bronze level to gain insight into the regulation of gene expression. To produce an atlas at the scale necessary, we would likely be aiming for around 10 hosts and 9 pathogen panels at about 200 accessions each. This would likely include land races and winter and spring varieties of bread and durum wheat, as well as the progenitor species, Triticum arati, Dicocoides and Aegyptalshai, perhaps along with some mod grasses like Vinopyrum. 
The nine most important pathogens to include would likely be Fusarium head bite, blast, the rust, the blotch diseases, and powdery mildew. And in total, the sequencing would cost $7.6 million. But there's also, of course, the cost of employing people to perform the bulking, pathology experiments, the cloning, transformation, as well as the bioinformatics. This would work out at around 75 full-time equivalents over five years, or 375 FTEs in total. We worked with Mark Lutherbacher at JIC to come up with an in-depth budget for this, but it may be more useful to compare it to an existing organisation of the same size. And for the last two years, TSL staffing has averaged at 75 FTEs. According to Companies House, the cost of running TSL for five years would be around $50 million. So we can infer that this budget could cover the consumable and employment costs for the Atlas project as well. This would work out at 2.9 million from each G20 over the course of five years. Coordination would be required to avoid overlap and make the funds stretch as far as possible. But given the 209 million tonnes of losses for pests and diseases each year, there will likely be a very good return on any investment made to mitigate these losses to wheat yields. Researchers and breeders go to immense effort to characterise and deploy resistance into wheat. But this investment can be lost in just a few years if genes are released in a way that may provide short-term gains in yield, but ultimately facilitate the evolution of pathogen virulence. Then breeding moves on to focus on new targets and so on. So how can we break this boom and bust cycle and make the most out of our investment in the R gene atlas? Well, we can put our cloned R genes and effectors together to try to deploy resistance in a more durable way. Pathogen populations could be screened for the presence of effectors, and R gene combinations that would target these could be determined, preferably including some broad spectrum genes that can recognise multiple effectors so that no R gene is acting alone. Once a suitable stack is at hand, genes could be introduced through more traditional crossing and micro assisted selection or through transformation. As the number of genes introduced increases, the number of crosses required may become difficult to manage and there is a risk of introducing deleterious alleles from wild or lamarous backgrounds. Crossing is also limited to species that are sexually compatible with wheat, which may rule out some wild grasses. Transformation, on the other hand, would allow all genes to be introduced at a single locus and prevent the separation of genes, making them easier to track in breeding programs. In the field, cultivars are often grown in monoculture Using multi-lines instead that are identical apart from the presence of a single R gene could reduce the selection pressure on the pathogen to develop virulence in a single gene. Similarly, stacking prevents single targets from being exposed. We can also enhance durability by limiting the exposure of R genes to pathogens through time by rotating the R genes present in the field from year to year. This dynamic diversity approach could also prevent any virulence gained by the pathogen from being effective in the next growing season. But even if we clone these genes and have the best intentions for their deployment, how can we actually control the release of them? We have an ongoing discussion with many breeders around the world about this issue who would like to thank for their insight into gene stewardship practices. But it seems to boil down to two key approaches. An advantage of working with wild species is that genes cloned from these sources can be patented and would be unavailable to breeders through traditional approaches so their release could be tightly controlled and protected. This is the approach taken by the Two Blades Foundation, for example. Another option is to try to integrate stewardship practices into existing cultivar release procedures in different countries. It would be difficult to actually enforce good gene stewardship, but breeding for more durable multi-gene resistance could be incentivized by awarding these varieties with extra points so that their release is more likely over other varieties. Through this, we would hope to keep our genes effective for as long as possible, and perhaps one day make wheat a non-host for its major pathogens and pests. And with that, I'd like to thank my co-authors on the review that we're writing on this topic, um, my supervisor Branda and Shreya, Sanu and David from our lab, as well as our funding from the BBSRC, the Doctoral Training Partnership at the Norwich Research Park and the Two Blades Foundation. And thank you all for listening. <laughs>